Hello, welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Several years ago, the three controversial words stem cell research became part of America's vocabulary. Scientists such as uh, Reverend Dr. Tad Paholchik, Reverend Dr. Kevin Fitzgerald, and James Sir Shirley, formerly of MIT, have been guests on Life Matters to explain what all the controversy was about. Much of the controversy back then revolved around the federal government funding embryonic stem cell research. The key question concerned the moral and ethical implications of killing human life at its embryonic stage to do medical research. It's been a while since we examined the stem cell research issue. Today's show does so by first looking at the basics. We'll then explore what has happened since stem cell research burst onto the scene in public discourse in 2003. Today's guest is a senior fellow for life sciences at the Family Research Council. Before July 2004, he had spent almost 20 years as a professor of life sciences at Indiana State University, which was made famous by Larry Bird here in Boston, and adjunct professor of medical and molecular genetics at Indiana University School of Medicine. He received his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Kansas. More recently, he has uh, been a founding member of Do No Harm, the Coalition of Americans for Research Ethics. He has many awards and accomplishments to his numerous list. Uh, so without further ado, welcome Dr. David Prentiss. Thanks, Brandon. Good to be with you. Uh, Dr. Prentiss, uh, perhaps you could uh, give us a little bit of background about what is stem cell research, or why is it controversy, and that sort of thing. Well, you know, Brendan, what I've found, and I give talks about this all over the world, even to physicians, and about half the people don't understand the basics. So let's start right there. What is a stem cell? It's a cell that uh, is as yet undetermined, you might say, and has the ability to continue to grow and then, given the right signal, form any of a number of tissue types within the human body. And at this point in time, there are probably three main types of stem cells that people are looking at. You've already mentioned embryonic stem cells, and as the name implies, they come from young embryos. About a week after conception, when you really are still relatively formless, you don't have arms and legs at that point, and you do, as you mentioned, have to destroy that young human life to extract the embryonic stem cells from that young embryo. Uh, so there's a significant ethical problem about embryonic stem cells. Those cells grown in the dish potentially could go ahead and, given the right signal, form different types of tissues. But uh, as we've seen both with mouse and human embryonic stem cells over the last 30 years, it's very difficult to control those cells to make them form the type of tissue you want either in the dish or in the lab animal and it's hard to keep them from just continuing to grow and form tumors so even the ethical issues aside it's a very problematic type of stem cell now another type that most people haven't heard much about are called adult stem cells and Actually, you don't have to be 21 years of age to own an adult stem cell. You're born with them as a baby. You have these throughout the tissues and organs of your body throughout your life. They're in umbilical cord blood and the solid part of the cord and amniotic fluid. And their job description, if you will, is to repair and replace damaged tissue throughout your life. Uh, bone marrow adult stem cells have been used for several decades now in terms of transplants to try and stop cancer, but we're finding that you can use other adult stem cells from other tissues throughout the body and that you can use them for far more than just the typical bone marrow transplant associated with cancer. What we're finding is they're useful for dozens of different diseases much of it's still experimental, but already published scientific evidence that these adult stem cells can treat various diseases and injuries. Now, I know that to have a quote-unquote cure, uh, 
uh, has to go through years and years of uh, testing and all that sort of thing in many success cases. But uh, when you mention successful treatments, can you tell us what some of these treatments have been with adult stem cells? Sure, and we mentioned cancer. In fact, your listeners, many of them probably know someone who's had a bone marrow transplant, which we now simply call a stem cell transplant. But again, it's adult stem cells for leukemias and various types of cancers, including breast cancer. But they're finding now that lots of kinds of anemia, including sickle cell anemia, can be successfully treated using donated bone marrow or umbilical cord blood, adult stem cells, and even further afield from the old types of uses, they're now showing that adult stem cells can successfully treat cases of multiple sclerosis, juvenile diabetes, stroke, damage from heart attack, spinal cord injury, and, and the list just keeps growing almost every week of successful cases where patients, not lab rats in this case, but successfully treating patients for these various diseases. There was an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association a couple of years ago documenting that over 50,000 people a year are receiving these adult stem cell transplants for dozens of different diseases. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> I, it I is, yes. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that uh, you know, prevalent adult stem cells uh, used as treatment in these various and sundry uh, maladies. Um, now, uh, there's, uh, since um, I, we've last talked about this in depth, which was in 2008, um, uh, there's been some things going on. To, uh, for instance, I've read articles about induced pluripotent stem cells. What, what is that? It's sort of the third kind, almost an intermediate kind of stem cell. And it was developed first by a Japanese scientist back in 2006 in mice, and then he turned around and used these same techniques to do it with human cells. And it was also developed about 2007 or so by the original uh, person who grew human embryonic stem cells, Dr. James Thompson of the University of Wisconsin. The technique actually is fairly simple. What uh, Dr. Yamanaka and Dr. Thompson did was simply to take an ordinary skin cell, just an ordinary cell, not a stem cell at all, and then they add a few genes that in essence reprogram that cell, sort of like reprogramming a computer to run a different type of program. And for the cell, what it meant was instead of acting like a skin cell, it acted and looked like an embryonic stem cell. It could grow and respond to different signals and potentially form lots of different tissues. You put it into mice, it could grow and form tumors, which is what you tend to get with the embryonic stem cells except there are no embryos involved here. You don't need any human eggs. You don't need any cloning technology to grow an embryo. You simply take that ordinary cell, you add these genes, and reprogram it so that it follows this other type of developmental program. And it's actually a, a cheaper and easier way to get that same type of cell as we would get with an embryonic stem cell but you don't have to worry about any ethical questions in terms of young human embryos. You can do it uh, virtually from any tissue of the body, and many people have done that, trying to take not just skin, but blood cells. And uh, in fact, one lab plucked a hair out of the lab partner's head and used that to form these induced stem cells. They've done it from patients who've had various diseases. So you can make it directly from a skin cell of the patient and then study the disease in the dish and see perhaps how the disease develops or what types of chemical treatments you might use to try and develop medicines against the disease. And it's been interesting to see, uh, even though it's a relatively new type of stem cell and a new technique, how rapidly many laboratories have shifted over. And instead of doing experiments with embryonic stem cells, 
they are now using these induced or IPS stem cells instead, including Dr. James Thompson, who originally grew human embryonic stem cells. Hmm. So, well, if Dr. Thompson left uh, his own <laughs> uh, research on embryonic, t does this mean that uh, we're going to see embryonic uh, stem cell research uh, be obsolesced in the future? Uh, or is it obsolescing now? Or I certainly don't hear the you and cry from the media these days. Well, I, I think there is uh, certainly much less pressure or even desire to use human embryos and make human embryonic stem cells for laboratory studies uh, because it's so much easier and cheaper to do with these induced stem cells. You can make them from anybody and potentially if the time ever came when you were going to try and put them back into that patient, theoretically you wouldn't even have to worry about transplant rejection because they would be from the patient's original cells. But in a real sense, scientifically, things have passed embryonic stem cells by with these new induced stem cells or the actual patient treatments with adult stem cells. Unfortunately, there are still some people who ideologically have pushed for more embryonic stem cells, more embryo research, but they're really talking about using old and obsolete science instead of the adult stem cells and these induced stem cells. Back four or five years ago, the argument with embryonic, one of them was, uh, well, embryonic stem cell research is newer than adult stem cell research, so as long as we have the time with the embryos that we've given embryonic uh, adult stem cell research, we'll have lots of uh, scientific gains uh, just given the time. Do you find that argument still being uh, bandied about these days? Uh, occasionally someone will say we still need time to study embryonic, but you really don't hear that much anymore because time has passed and there's still very little progress with the embryonic stem cells. Uh, one of the other things we kept hearing over and over again was that they uh, could essentially treat any disease. You could make any type of tissue and so on. Well, what they're finding is that the practical problems of these embryonic stem cells, the fact that they like to grow and form tumors instead of specific types of tissue, or even if you've turned them into specific types of cells, they will tend to regress and start growing again and eventually form a tumor in the lab animals. We're finding people are not quite as uh, noisy at talking about all of the future of embryonic stem cells, and they've gone back to basic science, they've gone back to talking about laboratory studies of disease and development, and they're finding that these induced stem cells can do essentially everything an embryonic stem cell could have done and they're just easier to use. Um, are there, now we have many success cases with adult stem cells. Have they, have they had time yet to have any successful cases with human beings with induced, indu, induced pluripotent stem cells? They haven't at this point even attempted to inject these induced pluripotent stem cells into a human being because the practical problems, again, they look and act like embryonic. And one of the biggest practical problems is to get those cells to stop growing and to make a particular type of tissue. Invariably, in the lab animals, they will also tend to make tumors, just like the embryonic stem cells. In fact, one of the gold standard tests, if they want to see if a cell acts like an embryonic stem cell, is to put it into the lab mice and see if it forms a tumor. So this sort of practical control to stop the growth and not get a tumor is still some ways off, even for those induced stem cells. That's why you don't hear much talk about injecting those cells or embryonic stem cells into a patient to treat disease. They're still worried about eventually a tumor being formed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I know that uh, Dr. Shirley, who's here in the Boston, he's I think he lives in Boston, or he, he works close by, uh, over in across the river, across the Charles River. 
Um, he has a, a, a lawsuit uh, regarding um, embryonic stem cell research. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about that and where does that stand today? That's right. And, and actually, let's kind of wind the clock back, uh, back into the previous president's administration. President Bush had said, here are some embryonic stem cells, human embryonic stem cells. You're not going to put the embryos back together. There is a limited set, but here is federal money to do these studies on human embryonic stem cells. And of course, uh, we kept hearing that, well, within five years, 10 years, whatever, we'll be curing patients of all sorts of diseases. Nothing happened, but there was a continual push for they needed more embryos. They needed more dishes or lines, as they're called, of embryonic stem cells to study. When President Obama was elected, uh, not too long after that, he opened the floodgates up, to, uh, essentially, that people could start destroying more human embryos, uh, bring those dishes of cells to the federal government to try and get taxpayer funding, more taxpayer funding of embryonic stem cell research. They set up new guidelines to the National Institutes of Health, essentially a recipe to how to, to prepare and destroy the embryos so that you could qualify for federal funds. And it was sort of open season on embryos. Dr. Shirley, as well as Dr. Teresa Deicher, sued in federal court, saying, you know, this just goes against current federal law. Congress has said for years no federal funds to be used as an inducement, even, that might allow destruction of human embryos through a, a little thing that's put on funding bills every year called the Dickey Wicker Amendment. And it flat out says no funds for research in which an embryo is harmed or destroyed. Well, you obviously have to destroy that embryo to get those human embryonic stem cells. Seemed a pretty clear cut case. They sued in federal court against uh, National Institutes of Health and Health and Human Services. Uh, back in 2009, when the guidelines were first put out, the court put them off, essentially, for about a year until they determined that Dr. Shirley and Dr. Deicher did have standing to sue in this case. And actually, a preliminary injunction was issued back in 2010 that stopped all federal taxpayer funding of this research for about a week or two's time. Then that was put on hold, the funding continued, uh, the justices heard the various arguments pro and con about stopping the federal taxpayer funding as it related to this law and to especially that phrase, research in which a human embryo is destroyed or harmed. Eventually, the circuit court, I'm sorry, the district court determined that they ruled against uh, Dr. Shirley and Deicher, but uh, Dr. Shirley and Deicher appealed that. It's now at the federal appeals court level. And in fact, they just filed the final brief, and in April, the oral arguments will be heard at the appeals court level. Again, what they're asking is uh, there really should not be federal taxpayer funding for this type of research that's associated with having to destroy young human life. And we'll see uh, how that proceeds at this point. Uh, I think they've got some very good arguments in terms of current federal law, that that just should not be happening in terms of the funding. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, one, one question I have that uh, is, I find curious, I know the Harvard Medical School back in the 2003 to 2006 area, and uh, led by George Daly and Doug um, Melton and Leonard Zahn and David Scadden, uh, was really pushing embryonic stem cell research. In fact, Dr. Mueller Jefferson and I went to a seminar, which I call a dog and pony show, really, uh, where they were pushing that this was the, the way to go. Uh, is their reputation from a moral and ethical standpoint besmirched uh, because they chose to do research that killed human life? Well, I, I think they certainly have bet on the wrong horse there. And 
you question, of course. It's an ethically questionable type of research. They will try to make some sort of argument, as have many who have favored the embryonic stem cell research, that you know, on balance, if they could treat patients, why it was worth destroying some young human lives. It's a, it's a very Machiavellian type of argument, unfortunately. It's interesting, in fact, that uh, their labs have also been switching to these induced stem cells. I'm sure they're still continuing some of the embryonic stem cell research. They certainly are continuing to push for more embryo destruction. But when it comes down to practical results, the embryonic stem cells simply have not made good. It's an old science. It's uh, ethically questionable science. And, you know, it's as if they're sort of seeing, hey, there are better ways to do these types of experiments as they're making this switch. And uh, let me ask you, recently, uh, one of the very largest companies, uh, Geron, in um, this whole area of stem cell research, mm -hmm. Uh, decided not to pursue embryonic stem cell research. Could you tell us a little bit of the background about that and perhaps yeah, Geron what? is probably the company with the longest record for embryonic stem cell research, uh, perhaps in the world, certainly in the U.S. And uh, frankly, f since about 1998 or 99, they would say every year, next year we're going to start clinical trials, we're going to start treating patients, uh, they would do their fundraising. They would get lots of money in. Finally, back in 2010, they were given FDA approval to start a limited clinical trial injecting human embryonic stem cells into spinal cord injured patients, into the damaged part of their spinal cord. Now, they also knew simply from a couple of rat experiments that it had to be within two weeks of the injury before they could get to the patient or else it had no effect whatsoever. So they started this and within about a year's time injected a total of only five patients. And then as you mentioned, uh, back in about October or November of 2011, so really only a year after starting this trial, they abruptly canceled the entire trial. Now, their explanation was that it simply was not economical for them to continue. They have some other non-stem cell clinical trials going on. They wanted to focus on those. Uh, the, the answer sounds a little bit suspicious, since they had gotten a little bit of federal money but millions of dollars from the state of California and probably had over a hundred million dollars available to continue this particular trial. They not, not only stopped that trial, they stopped all of their embryonic stem cell research. They're just totally getting out of the field. And so you have to wonder if, number one, uh, obviously there weren't any sort of positive effects that they were seeing with the patients, but uh, and it can only be assumed because they won't say, but whether there were any negative effects or adverse events starting to come up or they were anticipating that might be the case and it was just time to get out. I see. And uh, uh, Dr. Prentice, um, just could you give us one story of a successful, I know there's been many, but one sto quick story of a successful adult stem cell um, case. Yeah, and, and out of the thousands, uh, Let's, let's pick just one, and let's, let's pick on spinal cord injury. So the Geron trial was not working, the embryonic stem cells not working. They knew, in fact, uh, after two weeks after the injury, it wouldn't work. There's a doctor in Portugal, Carlos Lima, who has published his studies a couple of times now on patients with spinal cord injury, but using the patient's own adult stem cells. Now, right away, there's a significant advantage, uh, several advantages, in fact. Adult stem cells, you don't have to worry about destroying a human life to get the cells for the research. Mm -hmm. So there's an ethical advantage there. Using the patient's own adult stem cells, you don't worry about any transplant rejection. So there are no uh, 
immune suppressing drug that the patient has to take. What Dr. Lima has found, and there are others that have shown similar types of results with patients and adult stem cells, but what he's found is several years after a spinal cord injury, he can take some of the patient's own adult stem cells and inject them into the damaged part of the spinal cord. And patients that were paraplegic or even quadriplegic have been recovering movement and sensation, able to stand and walk to a limited ability. It's not a cure, but even though experimental, they're showing great advantages significant recoveries in dozens of patients, but that's with adult stem cells, uh, that's, not with embryonic. That's wonderful, uh, a wonderful story. Uh, uh, Dr. Prentice, uh, how can folks find out more about adult uh, stem cell research? Do you have a website? Let, let me give you one that uh, I'd really encourage people to go and see. It talks about the adult stem cells and mm -hmm. their successes. It's stemcellresearchfacts.org stemcellresearchfacts.org. Okay. They can find uh, several stories, including videos of patients who've been treated with adult stem cells, as well as ways to learn more about adult stem cells and the treatments that are out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. We hope you found today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Understanding the differences between the wonderful medical advancements of adult stem cell research and the morally troubling failures of embryonic stem cell research is important for all of us to know. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life.